Yeah. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Hi, Bob. Hey, Hi. Uh, starting right on time without any technical hiccups. That's how we like to do it. I pride myself as being professional. Professional, what? That is up for debate. Uh, this is where the introduction slide comes in. I'm actually a professional magician, believe it or not. I quit my day job in 2014 to do magic full time. I'll never forget the day I knocked on my boss's door and I told him, looked him right in the eye, said, Robert, my heart's not in it. And he just looked at me and said, I know. <laughs> and uh, and I, it's funny. Uh, I quit my day job to pursue my passion to work as a professional magician. And somehow, four years later, here I am. I actually write more code now than I ever did as a corporate coder. But that's just sometimes, sometimes how life goes. I am still a coder. I, I run a company called Mago Tech. Uh, I build software for professional entertainers to run their business. Uh, I speak on the No Fluff Just Stuff tour. I don't know, anybody heard of the No Fluff Just Stuff tour? Yes. One person. Well, Two from people. From you. From me, yes. <laughs> uh, so, so actually, that's who sponsored me to be here tonight. They flew me in. and uh, That's the other thing I have to tell you, of course, is that uh, uh, for some personal, some, uh, some personal things have exploded, so I actually have to fly back out tonight. So I'm really excited, having just gotten out of O'Hare, I'm really excited to go right back into O'Hare and all of that traffic. Uh, so we're talking about Vue. Uh, Vue, as you know, is a re reactive JavaScript framework, yet another JavaScript framework. And one of the things, that you, it's like table stakes for any kind of talk like this. They do that quick little hello world, and they've got the template, they've got some data, and they show that one-way or two-way data bindings. They're like, hey, if you do an update this, it's gonna update in the virtual DOM, and that updates it in the actual DOM. And we've all seen that demo. I, I think it's safe to say we don't need to do that again with code. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm going to do it with uh, magic. Because I feel you can't tell people that you are a professional magician without actually doing something like this. So I just want to try something very, very, very briefly to kind of kick this off. And uh, you're right over there. Do you mind if I pick on you? Not actually pick on you. I'm going to be nice. All right, all right. That's why I ask. Just do me a favor. Just, just grab a couple cards. Grab, grab, just grab some cards. Just, yeah. Take those, you've got, I don't know, probably 20, 30 there. Mix them up, however you want to shuffle. You can shuffle them like this. You can do one of these, right? Uh, and then have, pass them off to somebody to shuffle as well. And mix them up as well. I want to get a couple people to shuffle me. So, you know, however you want to do it, uh, you know, like these are over, that's, this is called an overhand shuffle. Oh, I like that. But here's what's interesting. So as you shuffle those, if that's the virtual DOM, this is the, the, the actual dump. So, if, in fact, if you take one card from the middle and put it on top, if we're doing this right, then the reactive deck of cards should update the UI here. Get one more mix. One more mix. <laughs> However much. Dude, anybody wants? You know, we're not gonna. If we get everybody to shuffle, then we're not even gonna get to the content. So, uh, so, so I, I think I think we're good. Are you happy that they're mixed? In fact, just out of curiosity, how many times? Because you shuffled and you shuffled, you declined, no problem. You shuffled. So, I mean, approximately how many times did you say those cards were shuffled? Ten. ten. I'll go with ten. I'll go with ten. In fact, I don't even want to touch these. Hold these. So, if, if we did this right, come on up here, come on up here. Every time, think of this as an array of 20 to 30 elements. Every time you sorted that array, we sorted this array. Just take the top card and hold it up. Do the next one. What? It's a, it's a double equal, but it's not a triple equal. It's not a triple equal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's, keep Let's keep going. Every single, no matter what we do, every time we do it, the virtual DOM matches, come on, let's, the actual DOM. Everybody who shuffled, give them a gigantic round uh, I assume those match. I didn't even see. I'm just like just trusting that this worked because, like, I, I feel like some of this technology is like magic. The one I held out. Except for the one. Yeah. Did that work? Did that work? Yeah. Okay. Good. I, I, I just sometimes I, I I worry because when you're doing magic for software developers, um, their stunned silence and complete indifference sound exactly the same. <laughs> But no, we're here to talk about Vue, yet another JavaScript framework, because there's also Ember, and Aurelia, and Polymer, and DHTMLX, and Dojo, and MooTools, and Meteor, and jQuery, and React, and Knockout, and Backbone, and Angular, and so on. So we, you know, there's one thing, when you look at an ecosystem like that, 
We need one more. In fact, I saw the other day uh, somebody tweeted, look at the person to your left, now look at the person to your right. By next week, both of these people will launch another JavaScript framework. So why do we have yet another one? I feel like that's an important question to ask. Uh, one of the most obvious reasons, there aren't very many quality puns when you, when you talk about Angular. I mean, Knockout, okay, you can come up with a couple. A Backbone, sure, there's a few. Polymer, not really. Aurelia, I don't even know where to start with that. But view, like I feel like I've let you down starting the top, get, titling the topic, uh, 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 what do they even call it? Exploring, Exploring Vue.js. I mean, I could have done points of view, right? That's not bad. Uh, there was a movie called Room with a View, right? We could, we could go with that. If we, if we could stay on the movie theme, a view to a kill, classic James Bond. Or we can go a whole different direction to the fantasy realm, taming the unicorn. That's a, that's a quality pun. <laughs> or my personal favorite, Marvelous Viewniverse. Wow. wow. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. You know what? <laughs> I'll show myself out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no. <laughs> so, no, no, no. This is why I do magic and not comedy, by the way. Uh, there's a few core things to talk about. And, and this is what, you know, these are the three tenets that... Uh, that, that Vue talks about when they kind of justify their, their yet another JavaScript framework. The three things are approachable, performant, and versatile. What makes it approachable is if you know HTML, if you know CSS, if you know JavaScript, that's pretty much all you need to do. That's pretty much all you need to know to get started. Uh, one of my favorite things, one of the, the versatility things, is you can use it incrementally. You can use it for one little piece of your application, or you can build an entire enterprise class application out of it. You've got that complete range. And performance, it's about 20K. Uh, if, you, if you take the Minify production package, gzipped, it's 20K, it's lightning fast, and, and there are minimum op, minimal optimization efforts. Like if you've done anything with React, uh, you've got to tweak it, you've got to tune it here and there. Uh, when Angular, not AngularJS, although AngularJS had its own performance issues, but when Angular launched Angular 2, uh, you start building anything somewhat complex and it, you really start to feel the pain. I know they've done a lot of optimizations with 4 and 5 with the AOT compilation and tree shaking and things like that, but it's still this kind of big, heavy, bloaty framework. So the, the, the key thing about Vue is at its core, uh, it is, as the name suggests, focused on the Vue component, on the Vue layer of the application. And that makes it a lot easier, makes it very easy to integrate into any application that you're working with right now. Uh, so, and the other thing that they, they're kind of proud of is, is it's not this full-blown framework in terms of here's how we do everything and this is the only way and this is the entire package, you have to bring a lot with it. It's designed to be a view layer. And so with that, it's simple and flexible, but you can build on top of that and expand it and there's a few pieces you can add in there to build an application on its own. And this is where it starts to go downhill right away, because I want to build something. And uh, wow, all kinds of things. I'm also missing, oh, my logos appear in, you know, uh, that's random. So we'll build something. We'll just do a, uh, a little something something here that you can't see at all. Uh, this is kind of a cool thing. So we'll just go with this. Uh, to get this started, and uh, Zoom this in a little bit so everybody can sort of see. Uh, there's not much you need to kind of bootstrap your first view application. You need the package. That's about it. And uh, you know, if this were going into production, this would probably look, look like, if you spell it right, the, the minified production. But this right now is kind of the full package. So you bring that in, and that's that's about all you need. And what I like about this is. The, the, the biggest reason that I started working with Vue is because it is incrementally adoptable. You just start with an element. You get, a, you get an element, give it an ID, we're going to call it, um, I don't know, um, we'll just call it first component, right? And I think I spelled that right. And in here you can put kind of whatever, whatever you want. But basically when you create a new Vue instance, you're going to give it a container element. You're going, you're going to specify a container element, and basically you're saying you're advocating everything inside of this element with this ID belongs to view. 
And so that can be uh, the root element for your entire application, or that could be just one little widget and everything in between. So in here, the, one of the first things that we're going to have to do is create a new instance. So every new view application starts by creating a view instance. So, so we'll call this uh, world, I guess, for a hello world. And we'll just say new view. Now, when you create a new view object, uh, one of the things you're going to do is you're going to pass it an options object, just like just about anything in, in JavaScript. Uh, so in here, at a minimum, you're going to add the EL property, which is going to specify your container element. So in here, we call this uh, first component. And not much else is going to happen right now, other than we're creating instance of view, and we're giving it that container to kind of work within. <coughs> And I'll talk a little more about the, uh, the templating language and components and everything else. Uh, but the templating text interpolation in the template very simply uh, uses kind of the curly brace syntax, like the mustache syntax, if you remember that. So I could put something in, in here, and that's going to essentially be bound to, uh, to a data property that we can define in here. So when you've got the view instance created, it, it's going to add all the properties found in this um, in this data object to to view's reactive uh, reactivity system. So anytime something changes in the data object here, it's going to to react and modify that here. So I can just go in here and define greeting as hello. And uh, let's add another property here. I'm going to say city is Chicago. So if I run this, it should say hello. If I didn't completely screw it comma up. Comma after your L1. Comma on line two. Yeah, I probably need one of those, right? So we can jump mm -hmm. in here, get our, our greeting, our sort of uh, city, right? So we can kick that off. And, and we've got kind of our, our, basic, uh, our basic reactive template in one-way data binding. Uh, again, all the kind of table stake stuff. Now, the way this works, which is, which is kind of interesting, uh, one, of the, one of the big arguments in the debate, and we're going to talk about Vue and Angular and React and kind of how they all compare, uh, but one of the big things that's made React popular over Angular, aside from the very, very botched Angular 1 to Angular 2 uh, <laughs> thing, which I think we all remember with a lot of happiness. Mm -hmm. That was a awesome. pleasant time when they said, hey, we're rewriting the framework. We're, we're, we're creating a new framework with the same name, and there's no upgrade path. Good luck. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Mic drop. Um, so aside from that and a lot of bitterness in the, in the community that I, that I, I still sense because I've been, I've been to a bunch of Angular conferences, and, and there's a lot of people who are still unhappy about that, uh, one of the big advantages that React had is that it's it's very fast, and if you you know under the hood what Angular is doing with dirty checking and things like that, it starts to get bogged down. Whereas the way React and Vue work, there's that the the virtual DOM and the actual DOM, and it kind of basically does a very fast diff and say, okay, this has changed, that's changed, instead of all the watchers or all the dirty checking, and everything else that it has to do. So uh, because of that, you can't just add. Uh, properties to this object dynamically. So I can't necessarily go in, and I think this isn't going to work in Edge anyway. Well, I don't even why I'm knowing why I'm doing this in Edge. Mostly because after today, I think I'm just glutton for punishment. I'm like, you know what? I couldn't get, I could barely get this working. Let's just use, you know, IE 2.0 and see how that works out. <laughs> um, I'm going to open up Chrome just for <clears throat> because I'm not going to. Go in here and get our get our fiddle. I'll drop that into Chrome, drag that over, and hopefully. So, over there, drag this thing over here, and uh, yeah. So, so we've got that. Uh, now, if I just bring up the developer tools. And can you enlarge it, please? Uh, say it again. Can you enlarge the font? Uh, yes. I think so. 
My key bindings are all messed up. Perfect. All right. So yeah, we want to be in result. Uh, so I've got world in here, and uh, or not. I'm in that place. I'm defining my scope. Yeah. Okay. That's not going to work in Chrome either for me. Uh, that's what I get for working in iframes. So <clears throat> well, the way this kind of works under the hood, when you you know when you wrap this data object in a view instance, view is going to add some getters and setters. Uh, that, that, that basically kind of keep track and propagate changes. So if I were to go in here and pretend that this would work, uh, if I were to go in here and, and add a new property, and if I could type and, and add in Illinois, uh, that would, it wouldn't track those changes anymore because uh, the way that you would do that is, is you can actually add a property through the view object, but you can't dynamically add properties to an object, even though you can do that in JavaScript it won't be able to kind of track all the changes. So, so real quick, Michael, you're saying that if this was just a uh, singular uh, 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 file and whatever running in the browser by itself without the JS Fiddle stuff, you would be able to access world mm -hmm. as a, uh, uh, like on the global scope here. Yeah. And you would be able to say world dot Greeting, or would you have to go into data? No, or world. Would it, like a, would it just return like a view class of some sort? Uh, well, world is a view class, um, right. and uh, and but but you but that is a that is a, a property available right there to you. So I could say world that greeting and change it in the console, and that would change it immediately so you can in the application. What's inside of data directly on the world object in the global scope? Yep, or in, yeah. in in the scope of that object. Sure, yes, sure. Um, and so that works. What doesn't work though is it dynamically adding properties uh, by directly accessing the underlying object because because it didn't get created and didn't get added through a view. A view wasn't able to wrap all of the magic around it that allows it to track changes. Essentially, it wraps some getters and setters around every property, um, but it, those won't exist if you add those dynamically. And there's a way to do that. Um, and I'll, I'll jump back into that here in a little bit. Uh, but what I want to do, uh, so I'm going to extend this just a little bit. And I, I, I have a cheat here because I already noted my, uh, my URL. So we've got our data, but let's uh, maybe in here instead of, instead of, uh, having one, one object here, we've got an array that we're going to get from some place. So what this really looks like is, is on, this, uh, on this created lifecycle hook, I can pass it a function and say fetch and take that in there. So we'll do a fetch, uh, then There's a little more room here. Uh, then response JSON, and then take that JSON, a little arrow function, and uh, we'll say this dot cities equals JSON dot cities. So I've just got that in, in my JSON. So we've got that piece here, and now, so now that we have more than one of these, I'll just wrap this in an unordered list, and in, I'm going to create a, a list item for each of these. So if you did any of the old Angular, this might look, and there's a reason for this, and I'm going to I'm going to get to this here in just a second. So we'll say uh, greeting and city. And if I did this right and I didn't make any mistakes, we have uh, all the cities. Uh, so this is where I'm going uh, this year still. So I get to fly around a lot, which is awesome. I love United Airlines. <laughs> so no one ever. So yeah. I have, actually, a friend of mine was, uh, was tweeting about a really bad time. He was stuck in O'Hare, which I, I guess never happens either. And, uh, and he was trying to figure out what to do, and one of my colleagues uh, suggested, he says, what you should do is you should try sacrificing a dog. I hear United's into that. Sorry. Uh, sorry, yes. A question. So in your created method, did this 
refers to this to the object which is executed, right? Uh, so th yeah, this refers to uh, to the view instance. But like right. this is normally dynamic, right? It refers to the context of the function. Yes, normally, especially, and that's always one of those kind of kind of squirrely things that I find uh, that, that that I mean tripped me up back in the day when I started playing with. Um, uh, jQuery many, many years ago, jQuery, right? See, you know, I can, you can tell how old somebody is, by the way, by how they feel about jQuery. Young people are like, oh, jQuery. But anybody who ever had to write code, like, in the era of IE6, were like, yeah. So, no, uh, and so in this case, yeah, this refers, uh, this, in this case, is always referring to your view instance. So that, that kind of, that keeps things uh, uh, nice and simple. But, uh, yeah, so, so basically, we, we call out to some API somewhere, and, uh, and we get a promise and process that, and, and we're basically, every time when this view instance gets created, when this created lifecycle hook comes, it goes and populates this array, and, and then binds into there. So in theory, and I even tried this out yesterday, if we do this, it would actually reference, oh, now we're pointing to top. So if I change this to result, in theory, that should actually work, but it doesn't. I'm not sure why. It's because it's in an iframe, and, and, and nothing likes me today. So I'm probably going to have no problem making that flight tonight. Uh, but if we pop that off, then again, because you can access those data properties directly, internally, externally, and you can even load data indirectly, because uh, it doesn't really matter. It would just it would immediately update the application. So I'm going to jump back to the slides, because the slides always work. <laughs> And one day I'm going to learn to just record the demos and embed them in the slide deck. You, you can always pretend. You can always kind of do this, right? And, and, and people might just trust you, but uh, you shouldn't. Why did I back at the beginning? So I, I don't know if I should mention this, and now's a good time to mention this or not, but I do this a lot, obviously. <laughs> so in terms of some of the, the general comparisons, I mentioned uh, going into this, that uh, uh, I'm not sure why those popped up. Uh, that it's that some of that syntax might look familiar, like v4, and there's a v if, and, and and things like that. Some of these will look a little familiar if you've done some Angular back in the day, and that's not a coincidence. Uh, the the creator of Vue actually worked on the Angular team. He worked at Google, and he kind of saw some things and he thought you're doing this right, saw some things that didn't think were quite right and, and pretty much independently spun up his own framework and unlike everybody else's if they were created, this one actually kind of stuck. So there's a lot of different ways to kind of, to kind of uh, boil this down and I'm going to talk a little bit about personally why I think, uh, uh, why I found Vue a worthwhile technology to dive into. Uh, it, it does have, it, for the most part, it seems like it's got a lot of the best bits of React. It's got a lot of the, the things that I think made the most sense in Angular. Um, it performs really well. It supports, comp it supports um, uh, components. It's got a lot of popularity, and the popularity is growing quite a bit. Uh, in fact, just looking at the last, uh, I guess it's the last 12 months. Uh, look at the last 12 months. Uh, Vue has been kind of outpacing and outperforming in terms of interest looking at Google Trends. Uh, now, right now, a lot of the interest in Vue is internationally. So if you break this down over, uh, break this down on a map, uh, Western Europe, there's a lot, you know, the, the majority of the interest of these three technologies is in Vue. China, it's really big in Vue in, in China as well, uh, different parts of Asia. But, yeah, that's what I did, basically. I'm like, when I got the results, I'm like, no, this doesn't look right. Refresh, refresh, refresh. You just grabbed six days and said, yeah, this is good. I, if I would have done that, I would have just like grabbed this, these six days right here. And uh, I'm like, yeah, there you go. True. Evidence. What's really funny is, is I've looked at some graphs that people have pulled up uh, over time. So Vue's been around since 2014. And when they do the longer term ranges, there was always like a little bit of activity before 2014, and I so I, I wonder how much how much that is skewing everything, but probably not not very much. Uh, like, view, I think, is, is French. I don't speak French. Um, like 80 percent of that is China. Probably, yeah. No, because he's Chinese. He's Chinese, and so 
view is huge. Yeah, yeah. but it's actually, I mean, just. I'm kidding. Yeah. No, no, view is actually really big in Europe. It's really big in Europe, um, really big in Asia. Europe, and, it's, and it's certainly grown in the U.S. I know there are uh, at least a number of, a, a fair number of very large companies that are, are building full applications in the U.S. Like, they love it. And I'm a React guy, but. Yes. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, one, why company would choose a view over React? Uh, so, going, I mean, there's a, there's a couple. The, 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 from, you know, I'll, I'll talk about why I'm using Vue, and you can extrapolate from that if you want, because I can't speak for anybody, right? I can only speak for me. Uh, and, and so if I go through my, my reasons, that, that might make sense. That might kind of help sit, shed some light on it. Hopefully, like I can't speak for, because the big companies I think using Vue, Alibaba is the really big one, Nintendo, GitLab. Actually, I quote GitLab in this talk. But uh, one of the biggest things is it's easy to learn. It's easy to pick up. Like I didn't have to learn TypeScript. I didn't have to learn... I didn't have to like think about my templates in terms of JSX. You can do that. Uh, you can you can use JSX if you want to as your templating language, but it's not strictly necessary. I have a giant wall of text that I took from GitLab because they actually wrote an article last uh, about a year and a half ago, and they said primarily what drew us to Vue.js is it allows our team to easily write simple JavaScript. Getting started with Vue.js is extremely easy. Its source code is very readable, and the documentation is the only tutorial you'll ever need. You don't need external libraries. You can use it with jQuery if you want. You don't need to install any plugins, though many are available. I like vanilla JS, Vue.js personally, although I can, I can reach for Vue resources when I need it. Hooking Vue.js up to existing code is very straightforward. There's no magic to Vue.js. It's just objects all the way down. And uh, so I link to that in the slides, and I'll send that out if, if you want to put that on the, on the meetup page or whatever. And uh, the only thing that gets raises eyebrows of this entire paragraph, most people are like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Wait, jQuery? <laughs> <laughs> now, I, so I, I, I love jQuery. I, have very, I, I will always have a special place in my heart for jQuery because, like a lot of you, I remember when you had to write your application, you had to write all your JavaScript like three times, all your CSS three times. Because there's always like that one customer, or actually like 20% of your customers were still using IE6 in like 2012. And you're like, what is going on? And the product owner won't, just simply won't allow you. Why is it doing that? The product owner simply won't allow you to like deprecate support for uh, IE6 and things like that. By the way, uh, fun fact, you can't use Vue with IE6 or IE7 or I think IE8, if I remember correctly. It's like IE8 and up, or is it IE9 and up? React even. So. Yeah, which is fine. You know, it's, it's, it's time to move on anybody who's using IE8 or 7 or 6 or 9 or 10 or Edge uh, or whatever, <laughs> all of the above. Uh, but the thing is, like, jQuery's out there. So jQuery's still going strong. And, you know, this is one of the things that makes it, that was hardest for me when I was choosing a technology. Because there's a lot of cool little widgets and cool little plugins and cool little things that just exist in the jQuery world that you don't really have yet for Angular and you don't really have yet for React that will do what you need it to do or you've got legacy code. And I love the fact because there's a couple places in my app where I got this weird, quirky, like really niche jQuery plugin working and I don't want to sit and try to reinvent that entire thing as a view component. Not yet. I've got more valuable things that I can do. So you, you still have access to some of those cool things when you need it. Um, and uh, I, I think it's true. If you're building something brand new and you're using jQuery, you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, but I love the fact that the two technologies can kind of live side by side. Uh, I like that it's got this best of quality in terms of you know, the things that I really like about React, it has. And the things that I don't like about React, it doesn't have. The things that I liked about Angular, it has. And the things that I don't like, it doesn't have. And again, the GitLab folks like talked about... Like what? Well, um, <coughs> the biggest thing is, okay, uh, I don't need to write my templates in JSX. Uh, I just, I find that not as readable. I, I, when you look at an HTML template, it's really obvious what's going on. Um, in terms of... of uh, uh, I don't mind TypeScript, uh, but you don't have to have this entire giant ecosystem and everything with, with it to run your application. Like if you're building something in Angular, um, like I work independently. And I, I think I would, for me, Angular would, would look a lot more attractive if there were 10 of us. 
right? But as, as a solo person who wants to build things, that wants to build things that are testable without the kind of bloat and complexity that comes with Angular, I like how, not, not just how lightweight the framework is, but how, how little you need to do to, to, to go from zero to one. And so that was, that was kind of a big thing for me. Uh, but you've also got kind of the ecosystem and the tooling around it as well. So I'm going through this process right now. Uh, I have an old server-side MVC application, and, I'm tr and, and the biggest thing for me is I want to, over a period of time, refactor that application to use this, this, this kind of client-side technology. The biggest driver for this uh, among other things, uh, besides modularity, I, wanna, I want my UI to be a whole lot more testable than it is. Uh, you know, I, I, I know there's tools like Selenium out there, and it's funny, whenever I'm at a conference or any kind of tech event like this, I ask people about Selenium, and people only tend to talk about when they used to use Selenium. Like, I don't hear people talking about how much they love it today. Is that they actually use Selenium, by the way? Used it or using it? Uh, there, see, that's the distinction. <laughs> you're, you're using it? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, but the thing is as well, when you built when you built an application and you didn't design it to be testable, you didn't write your test at the same time you're writing the application, your your Selenium tests get pretty gnarly. And I love the idea of of getting something like Jasmine and writing, you know, writing all my tests and have very testable components and very modular components and, and moving that direction. But the thing is, again, it's only me. And as much as I would love to just throw everything away and rewrite it, I can't really do that because, unfortunately, my my, uh, my application's got you know those pesky customers that I have to deal with. That's the thing about legacy code. Like, like we all hate legacy code, but legacy code's important because it's making money and uh, it's got customers and people use it and people like rely on it. So as much as I'd love to just throw it all away and rewrite it, uh, I've got to do this incrementally. And I love the fact that I can do that and just and just piecemeal build components on the on the page. And I definitely, I could really do that very well with React, or, or certainly as well, especially with, with the technology that's already there. And, and it would be very difficult to do with Angular right now. And I know they're doing some cool stuff with uh, component libraries and things like that, where you can, where they're kind of basically taking some of the ideas uh, that I see in Vue and React and trying to adopt that. What was, I, I, I'm drawing up like, what is that called? What do they call this? They, they're, they're like, component thing where, where like it's your one component is like a little angular instance mm. it's not mm. ivy that's the new compiler or whatever but anyway they're working on something like that but it's not quite mainstream but i can do that today with you uh, i love that it's lightweight <coughs> i love that i have a low time to production that i can i can take a component basically where i'm at right now and and i love the fact that i can actually do this is if i'm working on any piece of my application the first thing i do is i refactor it as a as a view component or as a series of view components. I, I break it down and compose it back together, and then I add whatever feature or fix whatever bug or whatever I'm doing, and I write my test at the same time. And the thing is, the time to get to production, the time to build these things is so low for me that, uh, that, that that's not that much overhead to take something, tear it apart, and turn it into a view component. Uh, the documentation is great. I feel like uh, I, I, I think the documentation in React is pretty good. Uh, I do think the documentation on Vue is very good. I, I think Angular is a difficult, especially the fact that there's two distinct frameworks that, that more or less have the same name, and, and there's not a lot of clarity. This is Angular 1x, this is Angular like modern. Like nobody's gone back to all the, 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 the documents and all the, the, the documentation that was written a couple of years ago and say, oh, uh, this doesn't really apply anymore to what you're trying to do. So that's, uh, that complicates things, but I do feel like the documentation is great. It is, it does have a lot faster rendering time and update time. Uh, the incremental adoption I've talked about. I don't like JS, I, JSX, I think I said this like five times, so I'm not gonna say it again. <laughs> But, uh, but those are a lot of uh, the drivers for me. Uh, and it's interesting, there have been a lot of very thoughtful posts that people have write, uh, written blog posts and things like that where they've gone pretty in depth on their decision making matrix. And I love in the documentation that they do write a fairly even handed comparison as well among the, the various technologies. So you can kind of, uh, they've done pretty good. I mean, it, I'm sure there's, it, it's, it's pretty much impossible. If you're the type of person who's gonna volunteer your time <laughs> To write documentation for view, then you're probably you probably have already made your decisions, and you're, you're probably dealing with some amount of confirmation bias. But I do feel, having gone through this process as well, 
that the um, by the way did you wear that today like on, for my benefit I wear it pretty much every time okay it's my NWCJS shirt because I, I was for a long time. And also, I'm just standing in front of you, just like, like suck it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> for those on camera, you can't see he's wearing a, a React t shirt. Uh, but what I do nice. sometimes, uh, I gave a, last year I was up here and I gave like a, like a full day workshop on uh, Ionic, which is an Angular uh, mobile, uh, hybrid mobile framework. It's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Um, but I was wearing a native script t-shirt the entire day and not a single person commented on it and that kind of that made me sad <laughs> and I think I'm just gonna do more of that so I'm probably uh, the next time I give it's just something I do it's my own little like private joke um, but uh, I'm probably gonna like wear a react t-shirt the next time I give this talk I just have to get one I haven't been to any conferences where they gave me one yet so and by the way so this is a conference t-shirt pretty much all I own now are conference t-shirts I've got a conference backpack here. Pretty much all the backpacks in our conference backpacks. Um, I'm pretty sure this is like a conference remote. I don't know that somebody gave to me. But anyway, we've got plenty of time, right, Mark? Well, it depends whether you want to go home or not. <laughs> <laughs> the flight's only boarding in like an hour and a half. I've got plenty of time. Two. Yeah, time. Yes, two hours. Yeah, that's the rule. 45 minutes, that'll hurt. Yeah. <laughs> all right. You've probably got half an hour before you need to run. All right, and I don't run, only when chased. Okay, you've got 10 minutes before you need to struggle. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I, I threw together a pretty simple uh, example where we're getting data from an API, we're, we're binding it in the page and, and doing things. So, and, and that's, that's kind of the core of, of, of the templating engine. The templating engine is actually fairly sophisticated. Uh, there's a lot of cool capabilities, but at the core, you just de declaratively bind to the rendered DOM. And, and it'll declaratively bind to the underlying view instances data. Uh, all of your Vue.js templates are valid HTML, and they can be parsed by any, <coughs> any spec compliant browser. Now, under the hood, it compiles that down into virtual DOM render functions. So you combine that with their reactivity system. And what's cool about it is in the same way that, that you get great performance out of React, it's able to figure out the minimum number of components that it needs to re-render or what it needs to, uh, what, what changes it needs to apply, the minimum number of changes anytime the state changes. Uh, so going through just some of the capabilities of, of the templating engine, you've already seen me do this. Um, in fact, I think I did exactly that. Uh, like literally exactly that. Um, the, uh, the mustache syntax, the double curly braces. So the basic form of binding, one-way data binding is uh, with the curly braces. Now, if you're only going to bind something once, you don't need the reactive capabilities, you can specify this v once directive, and you're essentially telling, telling a view that you don't need to apply any data changes. Um, but that, that, will, that will affect everything, all the bindings in the same or the children node. Um, the other thing that's kind of worth noting is that <coughs> It's always going to treat these as, as plain text. So if you, if you need to output like actual HTML for whatever reason, then there's a directive that you can use in terms of the container. Uh, you would just give it the vHTML directive, and it would render it as raw HTML rather than kind of doing all the, the nice stuff and escaping HTML entities and things like that. Uh, so you can do this here, but you can't do this here. Uh, so in terms of actually binding values to properties, that's not going to work. Uh, you use attribute binding. Uh, and the way that you would essentially do this is this uh, vbind directive. And you, you vbind to whatever property of the element that you're working with uh, to, to bind that. Uh, there's a couple kind of interesting things with that as well. So if you've got uh, a Boolean value, and the value is false. In, in those cases, it actually doesn't, it doesn't bind to false, it just ignores it. So let's say we had an option element that we wanted to potentially disable. If I was binding, you know, the V bind, uh, disable, and then a Boolean, if that bool was false, then it would just kind of ignore that entire binding. Um, so it wouldn't even be rendered until that value became true. Uh, the, the one kind of, the, the, the other kind of special case here as well is, uh, uh, again, 
with the with the bully because the the, the boolean binding it's not even going to render. Uh, this is what what this is doing essentially. If this active is true, it's going to apply this is active class. Um, and again, text danger is only gonna, is only going to render if it has errors true. So in this particular case, the active class uh, would apply, and it would not have that has error class until that underlying data changed. Um, there's other ways to apply styles as well. There's an object notation, so you can basically just plug an object into there if you want to. This would render the same the same result ultimately. Um, you can also do this the same kinds of thing with inline styles. You can you can bind an object to the style attribute if you want to do that. Although that's the kind of thing that your colleagues might kick you for later. Um, trust me, that's happened. Uh, but the other cool thing that I like about this is that you can um, you you can use the full power of JavaScript in these bindings. So I can evaluate some kind of expression. Now, the way that this works, you can only evaluate one single expression. Uh, you, can't, you can't have several lines of code in there unless you want to write some like, very terse functional notation that's going to evaluate a single, a single expression out. Uh, but you can do this. And for really simple things, obviously, this is not something that you necessarily want to do a lot of. One, because this is not, as far as patterns go, this is not a very testable pattern. Uh, but beyond that, you don't want to put a lot of this kind of logic into your template. Like this is something that we've tried to separate out for quite a while. So anytime you've got any kind of conflict, anything that beyond this sort of ternary operator to do some simple logic, it probably makes sense to wrap in a computed property. <coughs> so you know we have our data object that contains the data for that instance of view, uh, but there's also a computed object that would contain essentially methods, uh, essentially getters and setters. Um, so if we had some kind of complex logic that was either multiple lines of code, or this was something that we just wanted to be able to break into its own method that we can test, you can wrap it in a, uh, you can wrap this in a function here, and then you would just bind this computed property in your template. Uh, you, can also you can also define these as methods. So there's a separate, in the view object, uh, in the view instance, there's a separate uh, collection of methods that exist. So you can define that as a method. And um, so I just had a curiosity off the top of your head. Why would you do one or the other? So these are functionally identical. If I have complex computed property bound to my template as a computed getter, and I had complex computed property as a bound to a method, and they both return the same result. Can anybody think of a reason you use one or the other? Because they're, they're functionally, they do the exact same thing in terms of what actually gets rendered. Is the getter cached somehow? The, the getter is cached. Uh, the method will get evaluated every single time. And so if you desire that behavior, great, make it a method. If you, if, uh, but, but otherwise, it, all the calls in, in, a, in a given render, those will be, those will be cached. Um, so you you get the same result out over again. Yes. Maybe a dumb question, but uh, if you create a new view with the um, compute method, uh, does that get cached in both, or is that individually cached? Uh, so they they will be, and, and I'll get to that. Like if, like if you've got <coughs> one comp component, for example, that has a method, and then you have several instances of that component. Yes. Uh, depending on how you set it up. Uh, in most cases, uh, they will be cached per method, uh, but it is possible to like end up sharing data. And I don't know if I'm going to get to the coding example of that. Uh, so normally, you, you want to end up with um, a, a derived data object for a component. So if you ha it, like, in our really simple example, we just had an object in data here. If we did this in a, if we created a component and, and wrote an object here, just a simple data object then that, become, that data object becomes shared. So instead, what you want to do is, in here, you have a function that returns an object, and then you've got a distinct instance of that data object for every instance of that component. Um, so we talked about getters. You can also define setters in your computed. So let's say you wanted to, this is an example from the documentation. If you wanted to be able to set the name and then parse it out as first name and last name, 
but, but someone's going to give you a, a complete name. You can write a setter that will then decompose that and then update the methods, update the data properties of that particular instance of view. Uh, so you can define setters as well. Uh, by default, your computed, uh, your computed um, methods or your computed properties there are just getters, but you can define them as setters when you need them. And, um, uh, oh, sorry, did you have a question? No, no. Okay. I never know if somebody's stretching or just moving or, I, for a very, very <coughs> brief time that I don't talk about, I worked as an auctioneer. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so you're like hyper aware because some people, yeah, some people do that with the sign. Uh, there are plenty of like hipster auctioneer goers. This is their signal. <laughs> and I, yeah, I missed that the first time. And I'm like, so, and the guy's like, hey, he gets up in my face, like, who the hell? I was bidding. I'm like, no, you weren't. I did that. How'd you miss that? <laughs> anyway, I digress. Sorry, I just I brought something back. So every time I see, like, especially if you scratch your nose, that's another one. <laughs> that, that all the time, like, oh, you have a question? So, um, <laughs> One of the things you can, you can do as well is, um, uh, one of the things you can do here, and I'm not sure why this slide is here, because this is not the right example of what I'm about to talk about. I'm going to talk about this. Uh, so you can, so you, what you're doing is you've got a center, and then you can go through and say, okay, I'm just going to set this value and break it up. Uh, now you can accomplish the same thing there with a, with a watch. You can define watches, and if you're coming from an AngularJS background, that probably feels uh, pretty comfortable for you. It's it's pretty common pattern in AngularJS, uh, but in most cases, your computed properties and your computed setters are, are more appropriate. Um, but the thing is, uh, in this method object here as well, uh, essentially, any methods that are germane to your component or to your view instant, it's kind of get packaged up in here. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about event handling. How much time do you think I have to stroll? It's now 7.30. All right. You've so maybe 10 minutes, five minutes for questions. All right. How many slides do I have left? Wait, what time is it? 9.30. But it boards at, at 8.45. <coughs> so he's looking at an hour to get there. I'm good at airports. I'll be fine. Yeah. I got pre-check. No, it's breeze not, it's right not through. It's going to take an hour to get there on a, on a what is it? Thursday night. Thursday night, the busiest night of the week at the airport, you mean? Yeah, that one. No, no, that one. Thursday. Oh, you're right, actually. Everybody's yes, going home. Yes, it is. It's Thursday night. So yeah, everybody's going home. We've got plenty of time. <laughs> 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 okay, I will give you this number when you leave. You can sleep in this house. All right, tell me more. All right. <laughs> uh, so, so one of the things that's worth talking about, and, and, and this is one of the only other areas that, that I've come at that... Um, that a lot of people, especially from like a vanilla JS background, kind of bristle at uh, in terms of how, how event handling works. Because uh, a lot of times you're binding the events. Like, like here, uh, I can you know, just do V on, click, and then I would pass a method. The method would be defined in my, uh, in my methods object there, or my methods property in the Vue.js object. Um, and so, so you, you know, and I'll, I'll get to that piece in just a minute. Uh, but there's a, but the thing is, you can you can call like whatever JavaScript you want in here, or you can call it to a method that exists in your view instance or your component instance. Uh, but the other thing that you notice is in there is this dollar event property. So that's there as well. If for what if if for some reason you need access to the underlying event to do something like uh, the most common thing that we do anytime we're writing something like that is like a prevent default. Right, we're saying, okay, well, I want you to click on this, but don't actually click on this. Uh, so you can do that in the method if you want to. You can access that uh, that event. Uh, you can actually access that underlying event, that click event, or what have you, if you want to. But in a lot of cases, there are easier and cleaner and better ways to do this. Um, one of the things that I like that um, that view gives you is a bunch of uh, postfix event modifiers. So you've got stop, you've got prevent, uh, you have capture, once, passive, self. Uh, you've got all these modifiers in here. And um, if you want to do something like prevent the event from pro propagating, just add a dot stop mm -hmm. to, the, uh, uh, to the event here, on click dot stop. 
or on submit.prevent, or you can chain them on, on click.stop.prevent would, would basically do, would, would stop the propagation of the event, and the submit event would no longer reload the page. Um, or you can, you can just modify the actual event happening without calling out any event. Um, so all of these are, are kind of basically defined out um, in terms of uh, in terms of passive and things like that. Uh, order matters, of course, when you're using modifiers and chaining them uh, because the codes are going to generally be generated in that order. So if you've got on click.prevent.self, it will prevent all the clicks, whereas if you're doing click.self.prevent, only prevents clicks on the element itself. Um, and and, and I, I like this notation. This is the one thing that people bristle on a little bit, where we're actually like you've got my on scroll, and we we mentioned that method there. Uh, we've got those listeners, and uh, this is the one that, that people bristle at a little bit because they're like, didn't we agree that this was a bad idea like 15 years ago? That uh, you know, this is what I've realized that there are two types of criminals in the world, right? There are criminals who put. JavaScript in their HTML, and there are criminals who put HTML in their JavaScript. <laughs> and you have to make a decision about which criminal you're going to be. I apparently am both. Um, and that may or may not be why I'm fleeing the, the city tonight. Um, but my thoughts on this, it's easier to locate the handlers by skimming the code. That was the one thing I never got the hang of, especially back in the jQuery days or anything else, where you're binding these events somewhere else there's no real obvious way, oh, clicking on this does that. You've got to go and find those things. I like that. I find that useful. Uh, what I like about this as well as it means my view model is pure logic. It, my view model doesn't have to know anything about the DOM other than the element that, is being, that it's being bound to. Uh, your listeners automatically get cleaned up uh, when, when, the, uh, when the component is disposed or the instance is disposed, so you don't have to worry about that as well. Uh, so you start putting all these different pieces together. You've got your container element. Yes? I was going to say that all your arguments there, and I know you don't like JSX, but those are the arguments for JSX. I know. Okay. I know. I know. Just on click equals function right there. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I, I, I'm not going to. Yeah. It's just it's my own thing. I'm just weird. But if you love JSX, then <laughs> if that's why listeners and you like to be able to skim the template and see the list. Well, I still have the template there, but my template is just a... Uh, yeah, but the JSX template says unclick equals function. Yeah, all right, all right. All right. I'll give you that. I'll go, I'll go with that. I'll go with that. <laughs> but I will say this, though. So, so you have this like simple JavaScript object that has an element. It has your methods. It has your computed getters and setters. It has your lifecycle elements and lifecycle hooks. It's got a template. It's got the style scoped to that element. And it starts to wrap everything up into a nice, neat little package. Oh, come on. Where's my audio? Oh, it's it's doing that. You know? Turn it up on your laptop, maybe? Well, it's... The audio is going through the projector right now. Yeah. Is the projector at speakers? No. <laughs> no. The HDMI cable doesn't know that, though. Yeah. It doesn't. <laughs> Sound, <clears throat> output, Can you just there we go, there we go, okay, slideshow, I just have to do this, I, I, I went through so much trouble to find this video clip so I could say, Oh, I got it. <laughs> it would have been funnier if I hadn't, whatever. A neat little package. So everything gets encapsulated into this object, a simple JavaScript object. You can your container element, your data properties, your methods, your computer getters and setters, your lifecycle hooks, your watch callbacks, your transitions, your template, your styles, all of these pieces. Everything is, is wrapped up, everything is scoped, everything is testable, and your view models and your template, your components, they're just JavaScript, or they're, they're just JS objects. And, um, and it becomes pretty beautiful, pretty simple, uh, and it's a nice way to kind of move forward. You can definitely do the kind of quick and dirty examples that I've been going through, uh, but 
uh, at a point as you start to scale up your application as you're getting uh, many components, you start, one of the, the, the common patterns is a component per file. And if you look on the, the Vue.js website, one of the things I would encourage if you start playing with this is actually take a little bit of time and read the, um, they have a style guide and they have on, on all their recommendations ranging from always do this, uh, try to do this, when in doubt do this, and this is a recommendation. So they've kind of, uh, they, they've kind of categorized all their recommendations like that. Uh, but one of them, just some naming conventions, some things around that. But um, uh, but they've got some ideas like like they don't usually suggest breaking all of your components in there into constituent directories until you have you know a hundred plus components. At that point, it starts making sense to start organizing these things. So in the limited time that I have, I'm going to talk about components and. Um, because that's that's really where it starts getting kind of interesting. And how are we? Let's see. It's seven thirty-seven. I'm good. How are you getting to the airport, Michael? Oh, I'll call it. Uber. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Or, or or what have you. Whatever that. Yeah. Actually, I, believe it or not, uh, for reasons I don't fully understand, um, I can't use Uber anymore. Hmm. They, I they don't, don't want to know, Mike. <laughs> I don't know. I did. I did like twenty five hundred miles on, or twenty two thousand miles last year on Lyft, and they and like ninety five percent of my rides were five stars. So I don't know what I did on Uber, but mm. but they don't like me. I tried signing up with a new phone number, but they uh, and they let they let me sign up, and then they're like, wait, nope, your account's disabled again. Apparently, they don't like their drivers either. So. Well, that's true. They don't like a lot of people. It turns out, um, and that's why I don't feel particularly bad about that. Um, so, you know, where we can get to, uh, you know, to a component here, and uh, I don't know if I want to try doing this. So, like, like a real simple, like, reusable component here that I can, I can grab in here is something like, uh, we'll, we'll create a component, and we'll call it visit counter. And um, so in our actual event, you know, we've got our data, we've got whatever we're doing there. And uh, we're going to actually define this component in here as well. So in here, as its own thing, and hopefully you've got enough room in here, I'm just going to get to view and I'm going to register component. I'm going to say component, and I'm going to the name, visit. So essentially, components are reusable view instances. Uh, in this case, we'll call it visit counter. But it's and you, and you can use it as a custom element um, in, inside any view instance that's created with a uh, new view. And so, since components uh, are just reusable view instances, they accept all the same options as a new view. So I can go in here and. Uh, Define my, my my properties object so I can say data, and so this is this is kind of key here uh, that I have a data uh, function that returns uh, in this case returns a zero, and um, the other thing that I'm going to define in line is a template. And uh, I'm just going to say visit count plus plus. So I'm going to define my behavior in here in the template. And uh, I'll say I've been here. I have. I'm not going to bother with this. I've been here. <laughs> I've been here. And then I can just grab my visit count property in here. Oh, yeah. So I can use the template literal syntax if I want, uh, or I can just wrap it. That, all, either of these works. Um, that worries me. Thank you. I think it's just the double, double quote at the end of 21. Yeah, double yeah. tick at the end of button. No? Uh, that yeah. looks more like it. That looks more like what I want there. 
and then I want that that. And that's really about it. And I don't need that, I think. Yeah. Okay, that looks right. So uh, so I've got Hello City and then a visit counter. So in theory, almost. Visit count. Did I misspell something here? What did I do? <laughs> I'm sure there was nothing. This, this so I've got my data that's returning visit count of zero. Um, and then I got my visit counter. Richard, you know, what's he doing wrong? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, what am I doing wrong? Is it not data dot visit count or something? Because it's inside of data, so how can you access it directly? Oh, the the, well, the component instance ha exposes a getter, uh, a getter and setter for those properties. So under the hood, <laughs> there's an underscore. There's a private property underscore data, uh, but you would access which which also contains the getter, the, the uh, like observable. Um, uh, observable, whatever. But um, so I got my visit counter, visit counter. Uh, so, but visit counts like an object, though. It's kind of <laughs> there. Actually, is a view dev tool that I don't have installed in Chrome. Hmm. That is. Is uh, it visit count uh, equals zero? Why? Why is it colon zero? Uh, oh, you're right. I think because uh, it's looking like an object definition mm -hmm. instead of a function. Uh, well, yeah, you're right. I need to return. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna return an object. Okay. Hey! Oh, well done, Jimmy. Yeah. 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 They're programming. Yes, that's how it works. All right, but you know, I mentioned uh, we we're talking about uh, properties getting cached and things like that. So, if I didn't write this as a function, and I accept uh, a function that didn't return anything, which is kind of cool. Uh, if I run this, oh. yeah, I, I break it, which is cool. You missed uh, the, the, the you, you, you guys are great. Can I? Uh, uh, the say what? No, no we're linking for you. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, so if I do that in theory, uh, do whatever I did wrong. Don't do what Donnie don't does. Uh, then it would. Then it would actually update all of the buttons with the with the values there. So that's oh, a really so simple sure. example. Of, so yeah, and if if I did this wrong the right way, then uh, then basically every time I change the the value of visit count for one instant, it changes them for all of them. Mm -hmm. You'll just have to trust me. Or I think there's an example of this on the um, on the, uh, the the code itself. Do you have to do a function declaration, or could you do like an arrow function with a implicit return? Yeah, you could do that. Um, and there's a lot of shorthands that I'm not using in here. So, for example, like uh, like 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 for binding, for like 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 click binding, things like that, uh, you can just do at click. And for property binds, you can just do a colon binding. So there's a lot of shorthands. And if you read their style guide, basically their um, their only recommendation on this is either. Uh, do it never or do it all the time, and uh, one or the other. Is it at click? Uh, like so. an at symbol? Like, yeah. Like a, like a category? <laughs> I think so. I could be wrong. I, I, I'm having that kind of day. <laughs> um, one more thing I want to talk about. We had a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so that view component for you or for visit counter, does that have to be in a, like, a parent view component or can you actually just use visit counter outside that div for first component? Yeah, this right now this is registered globally. Oh, okay. Uh, so you can uh, you can actually uh, there there's a uh, you can uh, register this globally, which is what I've done. So that that that's available everywhere. Uh, the other thing just like we have uh, data and elements, there's also a components and you can register your components in here. So I could say, you know, uh, component, I can't even type because all my keys are in weird places. You could have like component A, 
and that's going to point directly to a job a class essentially so I'd have a I'd have something like that and so I can register components scoped inside that specific instance or I can register them globally and so that's kind of the, the, the big distinction there any other is uh, something like that component registration uh, like where does that get used is that like uh, in order to use it in your template of your component or something like where What's the part, like where do you now use component dash A? Uh, well, component dash A here is being registered inside uh, this particular uh, instance of view and basically anything inside of this container element. Okay. So that's scoped, so so this, this instance of view is scoped to uh, this div. And so anywhere in this div, but not outside of it necessarily. Uh, whereas if I have it globally created, I can have I can have three or four instances of view controlling different parts of the page, and that would be if I globally registered, then it'd be available to all. Um, but yes. Uh, first of all, I apologize for the hard time you received from the React corner here. I am, no, I'm enjoying it. Uh, but my question: You brought up testing a number of times as a test sycophant. I'm just wondering. One of the things I love about React is uh, test sycophant. Yes, go ahead. Is enzyme, and basically you can test your UI like like you you can test anything. Yeah. Just about. Uh, is there something similar for view? Can you test your components in a similar way? Yeah, so you can unit test your components. You can. Um, what about the UI? I believe so. I'm not using a tool like that right now, um, but I'll find out because I'm curious about that too. That's that, that's a piece that I hadn't gotten to yet in, in the stuff that I'm doing. I'm basically trying to get unit test coverage um, and getting away from the Selenium stuff. But I know there's a lot of overlap in terms of the testing tools and libraries, and I and there's so many of the everything out there in JavaScript that I I, I don't know. Probably is the answer. Um, but I, I, I'm I'm feeling the love from the React <laughs> corner. Um, nobody, nobody else is. I, I wouldn't take it personally. Nobody else ever does. No. But the uh, the test sycophant thing. I, I I worked with a guy once. I never got called test sycophant. Uh, but I was like, I was, I was working for a company. We had like no testing at all, mm -hmm. and it's very common. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was trying to sell everybody on this because I was trying to get some kind of like, like you know, consistent, repeatable build pipeline. And uh, and, I, and I remember I pitched unit tests. I said, you know, if we wrote unit tests, then like we don't have to test this once. And and I, this is the best response I ever got. He says, he says, unit tests are like that guy you invite to your party. Who brings beer, but always drinks more beer than he brings. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> well, my, my, my response was that, no, uh, unit tests are like that guy you invite to your party who not only brings beer, but, but when things get out of hand, you have a little too much. Not only does he make sure you get to bed okay, but he cleans up while you're sleeping. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, yeah. See, I, I should probably just like read the warnings <laughs> because that would probably help me immensely. It's, not it's tough when you're up there. Oh, it, it, is. it is, especially when I don't have all my like my tools and cheat sheets and things like that. Um, uh, so you can also pass properties in. Uh, you have to define <laughs> them. Uh, so just like we have data in the component, there are props. If 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 you're getting props uh, passed in, uh, you can define them in here. Uh, uh, props. And you can define these kind of as an array or an object and then you can you can set up some of the bindings in there. Um, that way let's say you've got a component that contains subcomponents. Uh, let's say if we, I don't know, I'll be creative if we were to make a, a to-do list, right? In a browser? Yeah, I write in a reactive framework. I know, I, I like mind blowing. I know, but uh, you would have like your to do list component inside of there. There'd be to do item components, and so you'd probably pass something in for each instance of the to do item. It would be an object in the array, and uh, so you would pass those in as the properties. And I know we're running like like moderately tight on time. When we're I we're like all going to sleep in our bed tonight, Michael. Yeah, we're <laughs> I might be sleeping on the floor in Concourse in, in Terminal One. Who knows? Uh, concourse B. Just saying, I hope Lyft gets here quickly. I'm going to call him now. Let me, let me look. But, you know, I mean, so in terms gonna, of like I where do you, you look at? Probably 25 minutes to half an hour to the airport, 10 minutes for them to get here. 
Just I'm saying. You're in, the mall, you're in the Woodfield <laughs> circle. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not going to take a long time to get here. Are you, yeah? Yeah. I, I don't, I, do you have change? <laughs> yes, uh, let's yes. see. Let's see. I'm just curious what the what the, uh, the the estimate is here. Domestic Airlines Lyft will get here in three minutes. Okay, uh, 20, oh, wow. 20 minutes to the airport right now. So yeah, no, we're good. We're good. We're good. We're good for at least ten minutes. <laughs> All right. If you left like forty five minutes. minutes <laughs> 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 you know, I don't understand why they don't have uh, clear here. I love, I love me some clear. You don't have TSA clear here. Uh, with pre-check here, but not clear. Oh. Okay. Clear is where you're like, I scan my fingerprints and I'm at, I'm at the belt. I don't have to like show my ID and get in line for all that nonsense. Um, where is it? Play from current slide. All right. So we talked about components. Um, you know, we'll dive in more in terms of like, like where you can go from here. Uh, you know, I talked a lot about the core library. Uh, and, and, and that's kind of one of the things I like. It's incrementally adoptable and, and increment, incrementally implementable. Uh, but on top of that, there is an officially supported router. Uh, there's, there, there's, there's a fabulous CLI. Brand new one. Just yeah. Uh, uh, CLI uh, 3, I think, is out. Uh, but you guys have Create React app. No, we don't. So, I mean. That's not cool enough. It's, sort of. it's a learning tool. It's not a CLI. Well, the CLI is. So, so there's a much better. I but got that. Cool. <laughs> is awesome. Thank you. React does not have no. anything like that. Yeah. Because we don't. Need it. <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> Bird. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I wish I had like that gift. That oh. <laughs> uh, so you got the CLI. Um, you know, if, if you want to like actually build something instead of like flying around with Webpack for half a day, yeah. I guess. That's what we do, is battle on Webpack for four hours. <laughs> hate our lives for half a day. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, that's transitions, unit testing, stuff like that. Uh, so, so a lot of cool more things to dive into. Um, and uh, I will be, I think, talking a lot more about Vue uh, in November. And so this is, can I, can I, can I throw one more? Since they actually flew me in here. Uh, you know, and uh, so there is a there's a, a tech conference coming up in November. Uh, we come to Chicago every year at least once. Um, I think there's, there, we were here in the spring. The, the tech conference day with the Angular Summit um, happening, but uh, that was in the spring. If you're in that space, uh, in the fall it's a little more full stack, well rounded everything from kind of front end stuff, to DevOps to back end, um, soft skills, kind of the the gamut of uh, different things. I like I like this conference series as a developer because it's content focused. There's no exhibitor hall. And I know that means you don't get nearly as much cool swag. But how many more stress balls and bottle openers do you need? Or I don't know why people do this, by the way. But they uh, they still give away USB sticks and they think that's a cool piece of swag. Except it's like USB one and USB two, which is completely useless for me. Um, so there's there's no there's no vendors. There's no. Um, all the sessions are 90 minutes uh, in depth. There's at least five or six tracks. Uh, so that's November 2nd to the 4th. So No Fluff, I speak on uh, the No Fluff Just Stuff tour. And so they're sponsoring, they, they flew me in here tonight to, to kind of represent. And, that's in Chicago? Uh, yeah, it's in Chicago. That's in Itasca. So it's right near oh, okay. here. Um, it's a little south, I think. Uh, so that's November 2nd to the 4th. Uh, there's a couple other events coming up. One is the one that I'm repping in the t shirt. If you want to get out of the frigid, bitter, nasty cold, I, I lived here for a winter. It was the second worst winter of my life. Uh, the worst winter was in Minneapolis, uh, but it was only slightly warmer here. And by slightly warmer, it, it like got above zero for some of the winter. Uh, although the water coming off, the wind coming off Lake Michigan. It doesn't even snow here anymore. I know. It's, it's about <laughs> <a> little warm. <laughs> yeah. I've seen little palm trees growing around here. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. Uh, I, I did swim in Lake Michigan. Uh, I did swim in Lake Michigan uh, in, on uh, January 1st, I think, last year and the year mm -hmm. before. Uh, did the polar bear thing up, mm -hmm. up in Evanston. That was colder than I thought it'd be. <laughs> and I thought it'd be cold. Uh, but if you want to get out, there's the Rich Web Experience, uh, which is held in Clearwater, Florida, in a beautiful resort there. I don't think that's actually it. Uh, maybe that's just no. This is the view from the hotel. So it's a, it's, a, it's if you want to get into Florida for a tech conference in winter, this is December second to the fifth. 
uh, sugar white sandy beaches and uh, everything web uh, web technologies there there's a couple other ones uh, I actually brought some coupons if uh, both for the discount codes for the for the Chicago event and then the, the, there's three destination events coming up so I'll, I'll be giving these out but uh, I think it's save 50 bucks on top of the early bird special right now for the uh, the no fluff just stuff event in Chicago and then if you want to get out to Florida which I can't imagine why you want to leave Chicago in December and go to Florida but if if you wanted to do that if you're going to take one for the team uh, to invest in the you know to help develop the company knowledge portfolio definitely come to uh, rich web there's, there's a hundred dollar discount for the uh, for the user groups and uh, with that I will say thank you everybody thank you thank you Thanks out.